Getting stronger. This is something that almost all of us should go after. Why? It's an incredible metric. It tells you a lot about what you're doing. Mostly that you're doing a lot of things right. Here's the challenge though. Strength plateaus are inevitable. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about how to break through those plateaus or even better, avoid them altogether. All right, let's talk about strength, boys. One of my favorite topics. I know. Strength. Well, I also like the the chatting about breaking through plateaus because even, um, I mean, this is, this gets, this is one of the things about exercise that actually gets harder, I feel like, because as you continue to try different things and you've been lifting for a very long time and you start to kind of peek out uh, on a lot of stuff, strength is one of the things that you tend to peek out on uh, sooner than later in comparison to like maybe like aesthetics. Like, I feel like I can continue to sculpt and build a physique for a really long time. It, you, you relatively quick, you get to your max strength i think it's hard to keep seeing gains after well it's a in the beginning almost anything you do will make you stronger so long as you don't hurt yourself right they come on fast and furious early yeah and then it's like so incremental after that yeah and it's just um uh you know it's you it's inevitable that at some point you're going to plateau or your your gains will slow down right we can't progress forever with strength right but here's i think we should back up and talk a little bit about why it's such a great thing to chase whether you want to lose weight or of course gain weight, or of course build muscle or improve your health. Strength is amazing for a lot of different reasons. One, it's objective. You're either stronger or you're not. So <clears throat> aesthetics is, is typically what people chase when they exercise, right? Changing the way they look. The problem with that is it's not objective, it's subjective. And, you mm-hmm. know, lighting and water retention and how you feel about yourself and your mood and all that stuff, you know, and what you've looked at all day. I mean, that can influence whether or not you feel like you look good or not. Yeah. Whereas if I add five pounds to the bar, I added five pounds to the bar. There's no arguing what just happened. Um, it's also, if you're getting stronger, this doesn't guarantee that everything you're doing is right. You're, you're doing is right. But it means that most of the big things are not done wrong. Right. Like you can't get stronger and have a, you know, eat too little. You can't really get stronger and have an unhealthy lifestyle for too long or have a crappy workout. Like, well, that's just is too long, right? Yeah. Cause you could kind of get away with, um, you know, some of these other kind of behaviors, um, you know, for a while and like kind of push through and be like really like mentally disciplined through it. But, um, it's a great indication of if everything, uh, is stacked together nicely and is working, uh, synergistically. That's what, that's where you see the real strength gains kind of explode is when, you know, you're getting adequate sleep and recovery and you're, you know, eating the foods that are benefiting and fueling, uh, your, your muscle building. Um, and, and all of these things are accounted for and, and your programming is, is great and you're you're hitting on all cylinders. That's where strength is really one of those best indicators. So that is okay. So that's how I use it. Cause you, you mentioned, uh, most people, you know, are chasing aesthetics, which was what my pursuit was most of my career lifting. Mm-hmm. And I every cared, client we ever trained. Right. I cared more about how I looked than I really cared about weight on the bar. But where I did care about weight on the bar or where I did care about getting strong was as a uh, a reflection of my programming. That was because here's the thing. I know I can uh, I can follow a shitty program right now and get ripped. It's yeah, with not, your diet. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. if I diet correctly and just lift weights, even if it's poorly programmed, I'll get ripped. I can do that. But if I want the maximum results from my programming and and the way my physique will look, I want to have great programming paired with my great diet. Well, how do I know that if I can get ripped from even a shitty program? Well, the way I know is if I am seeing strength gains and progress on weight on the bar in there, then that's my indicator. Like, okay, I'm maxing that out over there. I'm getting what the most I can get out of that. Mm-hmm. So that I'm, I, I know I'm doing the diet thing, right? Cause I'm leaning out and I'm seeing the progress in, in my physique, but then I'm also seeing results in the strength gains in the gym. So then I know that my programming is on point. So I'm maximizing the, the benefits. Yeah. I mean, as a trainer, uh, you know, someone could lose weight as a, a client could lose weight, but is it fat? Is it muscle? Is it water? Um, what does that, does that mean that you're eating too little nutrients or is everything right? There's a lot of guess. There's a lot of guessing in there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or you have to dig deeper to really figure out what's going on. When my client would get stronger, they got stronger. It was always great news. It's undeniable. It was always my favorite thing. And, and then here's the other part. Um, if you get stronger and you consistently get stronger, you're going to build muscle. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Like you can get stronger without building more muscle by improving your central nervous system you know, function, right? The, the way your muscles fire by having better techniques. So you can maximize leverage. 
you could you could do those things, and that often happens as part of this 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 uh, you know the strength gains. But if you do it over and over and over again, eventually you just build muscle. And then for people who want to lose body fat, building muscle is wonderful because you're going to burn more calories on your own. It makes fat loss a lot easier, especially maintaining fat loss. It makes it a lot easier. So strength is just regardless of what your goal is. Like this is at the top of the list of things you should pay attention to for sure. And you know for the reasons that we just said. Now, one thing to to, to express with this is because some people. When they look at strength, and I get this for specific types of athletes, like if you're a power lifter, Olympic lifter, then I, I get that. But for everybody else who wants to improve their physique, you know, who wants to become stronger, build muscle, burn body, all that stuff, getting stronger is getting stronger. So what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes people will plateau in a lift, but they'll get stronger in like four other lifts, and they'll focus on the plateau with the single lift. And I understand that. That's not. That's there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, um, especially if you're an athlete and you have to get that particular lift up. You're a power lifter. Well, your squat, deadlift, and bench press matter most. But for the average person, don't pay too much attention to the one lift or two lifts that you're not necessarily going up on when you're going up on all these other lifts because it just means you're moving forward. And eventually, usually, not always, but usually what that means is you're going to go up in that one lift that you plateaued in. So I want to paint that picture for people because – we tend to get stuck mm -hmm. on just specific lifts and they tend to be the big three or four if you add overhead press. There's value in that. We've talked about that many times, but it's not the be all end all because you can get stronger in lots of other areas without necessarily getting stronger in those lifts. You're still progressing. You're still well, moving I, forward. I feel like there's a balance there that the, the body's just like a lot smarter than we give it credit for in terms of like allowing you to generate more force and specific movements that, you know, maybe there's, <clears throat> you know, some holes in terms of like stability or in terms of like support or yeah. secondary muscle groups that, you know, need to contribute a bit more. And it's, you know, we just want to, we're just so mentally focused on this one lift. Why can't I get better at this lift? When in fact you do those other, uh, accessory, uh, type lifts and things where it's, I'm still getting strength. I'm still moving the, the needle forward. Eventually, once I am able to get stronger and, and more supported uh, in my entire body's framework, now I come back and, and it, it, it right. unlocks it for me. Check this out. Today's giveaway, MAPS Strong. This is a strongman-inspired workout program. You can get it for free if you do this. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Also, because today's episode is all about breaking through strength plateaus, I'm going to put Map Strong on sale. 50% off Map Strong right now. If you're interested, go to mapsstrong.com and then use the coupon code GETSTRONG for the 50% off discount. All right, back to the show. Well, there's definitely stuff that we know that we would address in the programming to break through these strength plateaus, but there's also outside things other than that. And let's start in that direction. Like, what do you think right off the bat outside of programming, like how we would change that is like a, a number one thing that you would go to, to help someone break through a plateau? Yeah. Uh, besides programming, diet has got to be up there, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's typically most overlooked, especially in the athletic community. Yo, yeah, you exactly. Right. Um, it's typically not an eating, not eating enough and not eating enough protein is typically what, or, or even, even sometimes not enough fat, right? Essential fats, but usually it's protein and calories. And I would see this more often, I think with female clients where they do have good programming, they're not getting stronger. We look at their diet and it's like, you're eating 1300 calories. Like you're not fueling your body enough. Your mm. central nervous system mm -hmm. is not going to fire with more power because you're not, you don't have enough energy there and your muscles aren't going to build because we don't have the building blocks. So you've plateaued because of your diet, not necessarily because you're programming. And again, it's usually not enough protein, not enough calories. Those it are two, two it can be carbs too, though, for an example, a, a classic example of that yeah. is what happened in the CrossFit community when it oh, was uh, paleo heavy driven. into paleo. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of these uh, athletes that are training at s such high work volume yep. that they needed that. They, th their body just was not operating and they were not responding because they were not fueling their body enough with enough carbohydrates. So mm -hmm. there are examples of where carbs can be the missing link. But I would say I would agree with you that most of the time it was clients either one, like we just had somebody a caller recently who was a bodybuilder, great physique and stuff like that. 
And uh, I mean, when we assessed his fat, I remember you did the math on it. You're like, oh my God, his, I mean, he was, oh, he's, yeah. he's in the forum Deficient now fat, and yeah. he is, he, even with him bumping his grams of fat, I, he still was under by 40 grams a day of what he, where he should be. And so it's like, man, you need to get your, your healthy fats up. But I would say most common for me was, was enough protein. Yeah. Like yeah. just because that that's so essential to the body, especially when it comes to recovery and building muscle it, if, that if you're not consistently giving it enough of that while you are pushing, trying to get strength gains, many times that's the limiting factor is because you're just not giving the body the building blocks to keep adding and building muscle on yeah. your body. And the good news is with protein is we have a lot of studies on it. We have so many studies that it's pretty well established what that number is in terms of grams of protein for maximum uh, strength and muscle gain. And it's Right around a gram of protein per pound of body weight, uh, maybe a little less in the studies, but I typically, we, we tend to tell people to aim for a gram because it's uh, you tend to fall just a bit short of that. Um, for somebody who's really overweight, eat a gram of protein per pound of target body weight, only because it's typically based around lean body mass. So if you're a 200 pound guy, you're relatively lean, aim for 200 grams, right? You're a 130 pound female, normal body weight for you, 130 grams. Let's say you're a 200 pound female, but your target body weight's 140 pounds. We'll aim for about 140 grams of protein. 200 might be too much, but that's basically it, right? Hit those protein targets. It's hard to do because it's, it, it does produce a lot of satiety. By the way, whole foods, make it come from whole foods. That's your best bet. If you miss, protein powders are fine, but ideally you want it to come from whole foods. And then enough calories. You can eat enough protein and not have enough calories, in mm -hmm. which case the protein's not doing what it's supposed to because your body's using it for energy or for, for other purposes. And then essential nutrients. Fats and proteins are essential, but then there's also nutrients that you could be nutrient deficient in that will limit your strength gains. If you're nutrient deficient, let's say vitamin D or magnesium or zinc or whatever, things that are essential, um, not having enough of that can also limit your gains. And then you mentioned carbs. Um, look, I tell you, you don't need carbs. They're not essential, but I have yet to find, well, I mean, I found some people, but for the most part, people don't get maximum strength gains on a super low or no carbohydrate diet. There's always exceptions. And, and I would say it's more than exceptions. It's probably like a 20%. So that's a significant number, but it's not a lot. So if you're like with the super low carb diet and you're like, well, I'm getting protein, I'm getting essential fats, my diet's good, you know, try bumping your carbs, see what happens. Yeah, for me, it was always that. So I, I fall in this category. Uh, you, you know, I just would, when I come into showtime and I'd start carb cycling and it'd be in a calorie deficit, it was just guaranteed I'm going to be losing strength. It just happens. And so, and I've tried, we've done keto and I've done some low carb dieting and stuff. And I just don't progress the same yeah. way. I need that fuel to fill those workouts. There's another piece to the diet that we didn't mention um, that I've watched firsthand, you experience, especially uh, mm -hmm. with us in the last eight years. And that's just your gut health being. Oh, healthy. yeah, absolutely. You know, you could, if you are constantly eating foods that do not agree with you, whether you think they do or don't, and you're inflamed and your body is constantly trying to fight that, uh, it's really tough to be building strength and seeing gains in the gym while it's being like a lot of your body's focus and energy is being prioritized to healing the gut. Oh, listen, yeah. for, it's it's 12 pound difference sure. lean body mass for me, almost 12 pound difference in lean body mass when my gut is good versus when it's not. You don't absorb enough nutrients. You don't have the energy. Your hormones are thrown off. Inflammation. It's a constant stress signal uh, to your body. So exercise being another stress means you can't tolerate as much exercise. It's just your your gut health is uh, is absolute paramount. So you could be doing all the right stuff technically with proteins, carbs, fats, and calories. Right, your digestion's off. Like Screw everything it, you're done. Is, yeah, it's, everything's going to go lower in performance, and that leads like directly into your sleep. Yeah, which is the next one as well. Because, I mean, in terms of gut health and all that, and like you know your body kind of fighting internally there. That's something that I had to really address because if I'm not, first of all, yes. Maybe I am synthesizing and, and maybe utilizing uh, nutrients, but then uh, towards the end of the night, how how I would get this reaction from those types of foods then would trickle into to my REM sleep. Now I'm not fully recovered, and then this is like that vicious kind of snowball effect where uh, I'm taking that in with me into the next day's workout. And then, you know, on top of that, then it just compiles over and over. After. Nothing will hammer your life a bit more than just chronically being uh, having terrible sleep. It just it'll it'll take away your cognitive performance. It'll give you it'll make you feel depressed, so it affects your moods. 
For men, it'll lower testosterone. Um, it'll raise cortisol, both men and women. Growth hormone is totally thrown off. And your strength is going to be gone. You're just not going to be strong. Now, initially, one night of bad sleep, you might come back and feel fine because you get all those stress hormones, which it's give you some energy. Bad sleep. But yeah, over time, it's just, you are not going to build more muscle. Look, here's the deal. Like no. our, we, we evolved, for the most part, in an environment that's very different than when we live now. And for the most part, if you were getting bad sleep, it meant you didn't, you were not safe and it meant you didn't have enough food. So your body is getting this stress signal. And that what happens when your body's under lots of stress? It doesn't want to have more muscle, which costs more calories, which is more energy. It's like, why are we, why are we going to hold on to those? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's make our body more efficient. Cause right now stress is high and we don't, we don't want to, to have to burn too many calories. So no, we're not going to build more muscle. And so you're going to be playing this game with your body if your sleep is bad, where you tell your body to build muscle and get stronger and your body's fighting you. And I'm going to tell you something right now, you'll lose. You, that battle, you're not going to win. You can fight all you want. And eventually you're not only will you not get stronger, you'll get hurt. And then uh, other issues will creep up. So, you, you know, I read something on uh, our friend Dr. Cabral's page today that I was unaware of or I didn't know uh, re regarding heart rate variability. Heart rate HRV is one of the tools that uh, most professional athletes use to, to gauge their readiness to perform in the gym. And they, they will change that based yeah. off of how low that HRV score is. And he said that the number one thing to improve your HRV score is actually uh, not eating three to four hours before you go to sleep. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, you know yeah. why that is? Why? You're, um, so we all know about light on the circadian rhythm. So if you're, if you're around bright light, your brain, your body perceives it as the sun being up. So it doesn't pre prepare itself for sleep. So this is why studies will show being in, in some dark, uh, wearing blue light blocking glasses, for example, or dimming the lights a couple hours before bed, you you sleep better, produce more melatonin, more growth hormone, better REM sleep. Because your body, your brain needs time to prepare for sleep. Then when you go to lay down and go to sleep, now it's ready. Versus bright lights, turn them off, hit the sack. You, it's going to give you, it's going to take an hour for your brain to even perceive what's going on and then whatever, right? So that's circadian rhythm from light. Your, you also have a circadian rhythm from your gut. So when you give yourself food, your gut perceives it as being daytime, mm -hmm. and it's going to affect your digestion and that's probably negatively and affect your sleep. Historically, we were never eating in the dark. No. Right. No, no, no. You're, you're not going to have – you're not going to be eating food and cooking food. In, like, we're super vulnerable in the dark. This is a time when predators are out. What we did is we did everything when the sun was up. As it went down, we went to safety. Let's all go in our cave and protect ourselves and whatever and get some sleep. So – you have a circadian rhythm with your gut, just like you do with your eyes. And when you feed yourself at night, uh, right before bed, it takes you're, you're going to produce less melatonin, worse REM sleep, you know, rest, uh, less restful sleep, less um, recuperative sleep. And then not to mention this, part of digestion, there's definitely things going on in your gut that digest food, but part of it is locomotion helps with it. So walking, there's muscles that pass through the gut uh, that are around the gut, things like the psoas muscle that helps food move. Plus you're standing upright, right? There's a reason why your anus is at the bottom and your mouth is at the top because gravity makes food go down. Well, now you ate and you're laying horizontally. Uh, that definitely affects digestion. Plus your body shuts down or most healthy bodies will shut down digestion when you're sleeping because it doesn't make sense for you to wake up five times a night to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. It actually releases hormones to, uh, to make you urinate less and it slows down digestion to... So you don't have to go to the bathroom. So eating right before bed um, is a number one way, easy way. Imagine to fuck the up your sleep. imagine the assault the average person is probably putting on themselves. And they have no idea like that. How many people lie on the couch or lay in bed streaming Netflix or binge watching Netflix eating while they eat crap. food? And it's not even healthy food. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it was healthy, you know, so just eating, yeah. eating, laying in bed and yep. watch and watch streaming, you know, and binge watching television at night. It's like. And then you're wondering why your your gains are stalled, and it's like, dude, these are one of the one of the easiest ways that you can dude, break through. I plateaus, used to fix all that shit. I used to laugh at. So I I had a, a wellness studio, and in my wellness studio, I did this for, for like 13 years, and in there I had this woman that was. I mean, I guess you could classify her. She was a physical therapist by trade, but she did like functional medicine training. She had all these. She took all these courses. Anyway, I would listen to her talk to her clients, and in the early days, I'd hear her talk about sleep, and I'd. You know, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't let her see or whatever because she worked there and I respected her, but I'd roll my eyes like, that's not like really, she's not losing, she's not holding on to 10 pounds because her sleep is poor. And she, she would tell these people that, oh, listen, we got to fix your sleep. That's why you're, 
you're not able to lose that, that last 10 pounds. Or, you know, the reason why you feel crappy while we're working out is because you're, you're, you're not optimizing your sleep. And I'd sit and I'd be like, oh my God, whatever, her client's slacker, whatever. But then over the years, I would see what happened with these people. And they'd come in, and at first I was, I was in disbelief. They'd walk in and be like, oh my God, you're so right. I fixed my sleep. I can't believe I'm losing weight. And I'm like, it's because that's not why. It's because you're, you're working out. It's because you're eating better or whatever. Yeah, no, and I would, up earlier. But eventually it start, I started hearing this enough, and I started seeing a client, and I care about people. I want to help people. And I never forget the first time I did this on a client. I had a client, same thing, struggling, whatever. Uh, this, this executive woman, also a mom. And I said, let's do this. Let's start with this. I want you to create a sleep routine, keep a journal. We're going to keep track of this and let's see if we can optimize your sleep. And sure as fuck, she lost weight and her gains were going crazy in the gym. And it was just from that. And then I was sold. I was well, like, it's okay. the, it's the compounding effects that also happen from it too. That like, yes, so many downstream effects. So that's the part. That's what I should have said. Downstream, not compound. Like the downstream effects that happen from it's very similar to what we just talked about recently when we talked about like adding calories into a diet or adding protein to a yeah. client who's trying to lose weight and the mm -hmm. scientific community is like, Oh, that's mm -hmm. bullshit. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's the, but it's not just because they do that. It's because they eat food that satiates them. It's that they hit their protein intake. They end up eating less. Calories. The same thing goes for sleep. Like you prioritize sleep and then then, oh, guess what? You have energy in the day. So then you're more productive. You move more. You take more steps. Hormones you're balance more, out. Your, your hormones balance out so you don't have these weird cortisol spikes and you're not you're not craving weird foods. So you make better food choices. You have more energy so then you end up going to the gym. Yeah, yeah. You have a better workout because you have more energy in your workout. And it's like, all those things yep. are all affected from that. And so, yeah, there's not this direct like, oh, having a bad night of sleep doesn't put five pounds of body fat on you. Like there's mm -hmm. not this direct yep. correlation to that. What it is is that it's the downstream effects that happen by either getting good sleep or bad sleep. And as coaches and trainers, I can start to try and focus on all the nuanced differences of, of training and diet and stuff like that. Or I can find big rocks like this that I could tell my clients like, Hey, we're not yeah. going to really focus too much yet on diet or your training. What all I want you to do is prioritize sleep. What I know from experience is, Oh, when they do that, they're more likely to do this. They're more likely to do less yeah. likely to do that. And like this, and all that is what and you're going to see that. all that from all those different ways of capturing capturing like stress like so the hrv angle right with you you see the readiness because you you know your heart rate's gonna have these irregular patterns when you're under more state of stress and so it's like you, you know if you're if you're not getting that adequate sweet re sleep recovery and you're going back into your workouts you can actually like crank that intensity up a little bit which is going to push you a little further in uh gaining more strength as a result because now you can actually recover and you're not just adding more stress in your bucket here here's how important sleep is uh, because we talk about like three main pillars. It's more complicated than this, but there's three main pillars, right? Activity, diet, and sleep. Those are the three main pillars. Which one will kill you faster if you avoid it completely? Yeah. Food, activity, or sleep? Sleep. If you got zero sleep within, I don't know what the, it's something like within a week or two weeks or maybe 30 days at the most, you're dead. You can go longer without food and you can go much longer without activity. That's just how important uh, sleep is uh, for your health. So, Fixing your sleep means this, going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time every morning, that way you don't have jet lag on Mondays. Uh, one hour before bed, prepare for bed by turning the lights down, creating a sleep routine. Don't eat anything two hours before bed, making sure your room is super dark or wearing an eye mask, um, keeping it cool. And that's it. Those things right there are covering most things. And most people will get dramatic improvements to sleep if they do that on a regular basis, on a consistent basis. Okay, so we covered the the big rocks that are outside of programming. Now let's to talk about through. programming. Now we'll talk about programming things to help break through a yeah, plateau. Yeah, so number three, most important, when I see somebody who's been working out for a long time and they're, they're hitting a strength plateau is their body is not able to stabilize the heavy weight that they're moving, okay? I remember the first time mm. I ran into this personally as a kid, and I say as a kid, I was a teenager, and uh, this is a silly example, but it was the most I'd ever done in terms of addressing a weakness. I was stuck. I don't remember what the number was, but I was stuck on my bench press. wasn't going up, wasn't moving. And at, when I was a kid, bench press was the exercise. Nobody cared about anything else. It was all about how much you could bench. And I remember seeing an ad. I've talked about this so many times on the show. <laughs> it's your rotator yeah, dude, story. there was an ad for this thing called a shoulder horn, yeah. and it works your rotator cuff. And the way I got sold was there were like quotes in there. My bench press went up 20 pounds. And I was like, Oh, let me try it. It wasn't that expensive. I worked. So I'm like, I'll buy this. I tried it. I worked on my external rotators, right? And my bench it literally went up 10 pounds almost instantly. Mm -hmm. I was plateaued forever. Yeah. And that's when I realized like, oh, 
these stabilizing muscles just weren't strong. My body didn't feel safe to let me lift more because these yeah. stabilizers wouldn't allow me to. And by strengthening the stabilizers, I could lift more. So stabilization is off. Listen, you're only as strong as you're- That's how stable you are. As, hey, as stable as you are. And stabilization exercises and movements have such tremendous carryover. One of my favorite, now mobility work helps do this, but one of my favorite ways to improve stabilization and improve central nervous system output and power, heavy carries. Mm -hmm. Heavy carries are phenomenal for this. The first time I ever did this, uh, in it, on my own was after I met you guys and Justin would talk about overhead carries all the time. He has Justin has this incredible overhead press, very strong, and he's like, oh, you know, one of the best things you could do is yeah, is, big game changer. Yeah, hold a kettlebell above your head, pack your shoulder, right, stand nice and tall, and walk and try and stabilize. I'm like, well, if it works for Justin, I'm gonna give this a shot. And I saw my strength gains go up uh, within a couple weeks. I was mm -hmm. like, holy cow, that was the the, the and I've been working out for decades, right? This is amazing. The second time I saw this was when I did our program, Map Strong. Map Strong, uh, farmer walks is one of the exercises that's in there, and you do that on a regular basis and, and it's pretty consistent. And I got to like almost a, I was like almost a four hundred and seventy five pound farmer walk where I just and I just felt like everything was just tight and strong. I could feel all my weak links having to stabilize. My deadlift went up, my overhead press went up, my curls, like all these exercises that I didn't even think were connected. Went out yeah. because I practice these heavy carries. Just keeping your spine stacked, like keeping your your joints where they need to be in the most optimal position. Like, and your muscles need to be a part of that process. So if you're not using your rotators at all, like, and you're not strengthening them as you're just strengthening your major muscle groups, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice because the thing is like your body, again, it's going to limit you. It has these natural limiters, these governors, we call it the overbearing mother. Yeah. And you need to almost like, you need to, to quiet and calm the overbearing mother. And to, to be able to do that, you have to focus intentively on some of those little things where, you know, this is, this is going to help kind of educate and direct, um, you know, those muscles to kick in at the, at the right opportune time. And so walking and doing carries, this is a whole nother dimension to lifting weights because now, yes, you, you pick the weights up, but now you got to move with it. You're adding locomotion, yep. which adds all these variables from lateral forces, rotational forces. And if you don't have that down yet, uh, it's going to get exposed. And and those are those little nuanced things when you're doing an actual compound lift that are going to come about that, that sets you, it, it, it totally causes a leak in your overall performance. Yeah. That's, that's the key right there to me is like when you, it's very obvious to me when you unpack that, like when you think of like, you just do a, a squat or a deadlift, like you have all these links up there, like everything from your hips to your core, to your shoulder, like all of these things that have to work synergistically together to make that lift work. And if you're not strong and stable and rigid in all of those links, in order to do that the lift, you may be able to perform it still, but there's leakage. Yeah. You're, and if it's if there's any sort of hole instability, in the yeah, there's exactly, and so there's a hole in the bucket. And so what, it, what I love about heavy carries, it connects you from your fingertips to your neck down to your toes, and you 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 couple that with walking and moving, and everything is having to fire synergistically together. You bring that into a lift, like an overhead press, like a squat, like a deadlift, and now you've taught your body to communicate better to it, and you've gotten strong and stable in that. And there's less there's less Less leakage in that lift, and you're in inevitably going to be able to lift more. Here's weight. how I like to communicate to it Imagine if you had a straw that you had to blow through to produce power, but now imagine that there's a couple holes in the side of that straw. Only so much power is going to come out. You plug those holes, and you're going to generate more force. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when you have power leakage because you're not able to stabilize. Uh, the lift. You're not able to strengthen the stable the stabilizer to support that heavy lift. You use the word um, uh, limiters, right? It's it's really like this. Like yeah. it's like a car that's got 600 horsepower, but it has protective limiters on there that only allows you to get to 500 horsepower because the manufacturer said, yeah, it's got 600 horsepower, but anything above 500, and we didn't create this engine to be able to handle that, and you're going to blow something. Yeah. But let's say you go and you reinforce the engine. Now you're able to, re to release or take off that limiter. There's no more rev limiter. There's no more speed limiter. Now you got 600 horsepower. Okay. Olympic weightlifters are an example of this. Olympic weightlifters, uh, they can generate almost all the force that they can generate because their body feels safe doing so. Most people, most untrained people 
can really only generate something like 60% mm -hmm. of the real force they could generate because their mm -hmm. body doesn't let them. And sometimes you can get that extra strength if you're super scared or super mad or defending yourself. This is where you hear the stories of the mom that lift the car off the, you know, the burning car off their kid is that, you know, under extreme duress, mm -hmm. your body overrides. Some, yeah, it takes off those because it's like, all right, it's worth it to hurt yourself. But anyway, you're in the gym and your limiters are weak stabilizers. Well, heavy carries. I mean, you what a great way of explaining it. Like holding something overhead or holding something at your sides or on top here and then walking. Now you're adding movement. Now there's a little bit of sway. There's a little bit of whatever. And you got to stay strong and stable. Like you want to talk about a way to, to, to strengthen your stabilizers without having to figure out what to target specifically or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a great way to do that. And heavy carries are incredible. The biggest carryover I see with the heavy carries are with squats and deadlifts. That's where I see in standing overhead presses. I see yeah those big huge. movements. Yeah. Those yeah. those big movements where the all of ones. those links have to communicate together. Yep. It's like trying to hit a baseball with a water noodle versus a baseball bat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, think about that, right? I mean, that's just, that's what it is. Is you have really? all this this <laughs> leakage that's coming out, and you can have all the force in the world trying to swing at it, but if there's a breakdown in all those links, or yep. those links are weak and unstable. Let's see how far you get that baseball. Yeah, back. which brings us to the next point, which is now we're worked on stabilizing. Well, what's a great way to strengthen weak links? Well, one way is to get real specific. You work with a strength uh, you know, expert who can break down your lift and get real individualized with exactly what you need in your weak links. But here's another easy general way that a lot of coaches and trainers might not even communicate, which is doing different exercises. Different exercises that are often similar to the ones that you plateau in. I'm going to give a great example, okay? When you do a deadlift, deadlift is a very, very uh, incredible exercise. Whole body exercise, great back builder, great way to build strength. We love it. It's in almost every one of our programs. Okay. When you do a deadlift, there is a, a particular type of tension that's created in the upper mid-back. And whenever you strengthen something with like this kind of, uh, you know, isometric type of contraction, there's some carryover to outside of that position. In other words, if I strengthen my bicep here in this contracted position, I get some carryover to ex some, some extension and some more contraction, but not all the way, right? It's not all the way like a full range of motion. Well, here's a great way to strengthen your deadlift by working on some of those muscles that are involved in different lengths, a zercher deadlift or a zercher squat. Why? Try holding something with your elbows underneath the crooks, your, you know, the bar on, your, uh, under the, uh, on the crooks of your elbows, and you have more of a rounded upper back. I'm not talking about a rounded lower back. That's not good. But the upper back, the shoulder blades round a little bit, like you're hugging something, right? Mm -hmm. Then you lift in that position, and all of a sudden, those muscles have to stabilize in a more lengthened position than they may be used to when you're doing a deadlift. Now, when you pull that deadlift, Oh my God, I feel stronger and more stable. Like Zercher lifts, Zercher deadlifts, Zercher squats, they fell out of favor a long time ago. Those are great examples of people are like, why do that? Why do a Zercher squat? Why do a Zercher deadlift when I could do a front squat, when I could do a regular deadlift? That's why. Pick another exercise where you do maybe, maybe heavy sandbag carries or, or, or where you're lifting like an Atlas stone. But otherwise, uh, by the way, this is why strongmen do Zercher yeah. squats and, and, and deadlifts because they, they lift Atlas stuff. They're, they have to do that rounded real back things. things. Yep. At some point, it's just weird to me that at some point we decided that uh, we, we needed to move more robotically and we, did, <laughs> we needed to have like sharp 90 degree angles for everything and make sure that our spine was always stacked and, you know, and, and you know, just eliminating the fact that like you are going to lift a really heavy like bag of cement or, you know, dog food or, or you know, and, and, and the weight is going to shift on you at that point. And this is not controlled. This is not like just nice, you know, equally balanced plates in, in a, in a barbell always that I can just kind of pick up and have like control over. And I know what to expect. So it's just, to me, it's just very much more of like, this is overall real world strength in, in different environments, different variables that are thrown at you. So to be able to train your body adequately for those types of variables is going to make you overall stronger. Yeah. The, the only thing I really have to add to this point is in my own personal experience, what I have continued to learn is like every time I add a, a novel exercise into my routine, something that I suck at, I'm not good at, and then I pursue getting good at that, it always carries over to my other yep. lifts. Yep. I always see this strength gain in my in the other big lifts because 
I started to train something that I was uncomfortable doing. I wasn't good at it. I mean, I'll never forget. And this was way late. This was not when we, around the compete time was when I started to really focus on Bul Bulgarian split squats. And I avoided them for so long because I hated them so much. Putting all this energy towards getting really good at that one, then you went back to a bilateral back squat. Holy shit. It was like, yeah. I felt so much more stable. I got stronger. I hit PR. Like, so, you know, a lot of times just seeking out these, these novel movements that may not be popular on Instagram or what everybody else is doing and, and pursuing getting good at them, you'll be blown away at the carryover it will have in these other traditional movements. That's right. Another one with the, you know, in, in terms of weak links is sometimes, well, oftentimes you don't involve power training in our workouts. It's all strength kind of grinding lifts, but there's no speed involved. Now I know that you have to be careful mm -hmm. with speed. There's more moving parts. There's a higher risk of injury. So there are exercises you could do um, that are far less risky that allows you to evolve a little bit of speed, but strength and then the ability to contract and it, it display that strength with speed, um, it, con it, it contributes to strength overall. So that's just one more thing uh, to add to this. All right. Lastly, Here's one that, you know, that I think is missing often because when we look at strength, we often look at strengths like super one-dimensionally. How much can you lift right now and then you're done, okay? But real strength, real strength has some stamina involved, right? Like yeah. you go do anything, any kind of work or job or chore or you go grapple or you do something like – Strength, it's great, but if it doesn't last longer than five seconds, it's kind of it's like a waste of time. <laughs> yes. right? Now, I'm not talking about long distance endurance. I'm not talking about being a long distance runner or whatever. I get that. That's a totally different stamina. But there's also something called strength stamina. Um, we we talk about it as work capacity. Your ability to to display strength like repeatedly. By the way, you know who does this very well? A pop popular. There's there's a class of athletes very popular. One of the most popular sports in the world. Definitely the most popular sport I would say in America. Football. Football players have work capacity. Why? Because they go play one, you know, you know, it's a first down. It display explosive power. Then they got, you know, how long do they have between the next down? And then they got to do it again. Like the team that could do that repeatedly over and over is, is hard to deal with. For two hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not like consistent. It's not like they're playing soccer where they're constantly running, but they have to be strong repeatedly over and over. That's work capacity. Well, I was just thinking of a more uh, sort of everyday average person kind of example, like if you're moving, like you're moving yeah. furniture, for instance, and like something that's like super heavy. Yeah, I can muster enough uh, force and generate enough to like lift something up, but now to like move with it and like keep holding on to it and just endure that strength and hold on yeah. to that type of force that I I produced just to pick it up and hold it. Now you, you have to maintain that like in and, and move it over here. It's just, you know, to be able to increase that ability, like gives you so much uh, versatility. Yeah. I, I have such a, a love hate relationship with this plateau breaker because i know how effective it is yet i dread it so much because it's, it's hard. hard it's so hard <laughs> yeah. like i did it's this grueling. Just, it's grueling. Yeah. so i i you know i had i have been pretty consistent with my 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 training lately and stuff like that and i should and what i haven't done in a long time was like when was the last time i did 20 reps on a flat bench press like it just never do that yeah. and never program that i never do that and i have to humble myself and bring all the way down to 135 <laughs> in order to complete three sets of that to do that but oh my god does my body feel it the next day it feels like it was the first day hitting chest again and i haven't done it in so long it's just like i'm so glad you said 20 reps because body built people who are like oh work capacity whatever i just want to build an amazing physique bodybuilders have known this for a long time bodybuilders have been advocating for sets of 20 reps yeah. For a long time, yeah. for building incredible super sets and giant sets and tri sets. That, yeah. That's work capacity, ladies and gentlemen. That is not just high reps. That's what we're talking about. That's part of what we're talking about. Another way to do it is to shorten rest periods, to do exercises that just require more out of you. By the way, at, there's another athlete that has to work on all these things. It's just, these are strong men competitors, right? Strong men and strong women competitors. They need to have this because they have to display strength, but they also have to display a little bit of athleticism with it. So unlike powerlifting, where it's like one rep, right. one rep, you one rep, have to move quickly. They're like lift this heavy, you know, round atlas stone, and then lift another one that's even heavier, and then lift another one that's even. Now the events aren't long; it's not like they're doing you know crazy endurance work, but it's. I mean, you look at a strong man competitor, a strong woman competitor. Tell me they don't have a lot of muscle. Like that's definitely a strength sport, and work capacity is all of that. And in fact, in fact, if you've plateaued. 
And this goes to the people who are only concerned about strength and all they ever do is train in the low rep ranges. And all they ever do is rest three to five minutes in between sets. Do a block of where you're improving your work capacity yeah. with 20 reps or exercises that require more strength stamina. Then go back to your well, heavy training. Watch what happens. Yeah. What's their limiting factor is fatigue. Mm. You know, once you get to that point where you've gotten really strong, but now, um, like uh, I'm getting to those same, like, uh, the third set, let's say, and I'm, I'm trying to produce the same amount of force, but I'm too tired. I'm too fatigued. My muscles are done. Like if I could build up my gas tank to give me more, uh, when I'm in, you know, that third set, then that's that's a whole nother thing I can pull from. Yeah. Well, and the, and the main takeaway from this episode, I really feel like is for the, the listener that is in a plateau that's struggling right now with breaking through a plateau and then to go through these five things and, and, and check the boxes of like, man, have I, if I really checked my diet and made sure I'm hitting my protein take or, or dove into my gut health and, and seen that, okay, am I actually putting some sort of a sleep routine of, have I really maximized that, go through that? Have, when was the last time I did something like have far, heavy farmer carries or overhead carries or worked on some like strong stabilization type movements like that? When's the last time that I put a novel exercise into my routine and got good at it like a zercher or a turkish get up or a movement that's unconventional like that and really worked at it and then lastly when was the last time that you pushed like work capacity when was the last time you did 20 reps of squats or 20 reps of bench press if you haven't done any of those things and you're in a plateau like start prioritizing some of those things and watch you break that plateau totally okay so here's what we did we have a program called map strong we created it with uh, a world's strongest man competitor Robert Oberst, because we want to pull from that type of training to create a program that will make you strong, overall strong. And this is a great plateau buster for lots of people because the emphasis isn't necessarily squats, deadlifts, and bench presses. They're in there, but the emphasis is on overall body, just strength. It's one of our most popular programs. And because we did this episode, what we did is we made that program 50% off. So you can get it half off right now if you go to mapsstrong.com. So M A P S. S-T-R-O-N-G.com and then use the coupon code get strong for the 50% off uh, discount. Also, if you want to follow some of our workouts, but you don't want to enroll in one of our programs for under $5 a month, you can go to mind pump media on Instagram and enroll, uh, for a, a basically get a new workout every single week. You get a new workout every week. It's less than $5 a month. It's mind pump media on Instagram. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was parties. for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 